Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Wrap, brought to you by Michigan Medicine Headlines. I'm Dan Elman with the Department of Communication. And I'm Jen Williams, also with the Department of Communication. Today, we're going to be joined by a Michigan medicine expert to explore a very, very important topic, mental illness and how it is common in our community. Now, before we get into that discussion, you can become an expert in a number of other topics by checking out previous episodes of The Wrap that you may have missed. For instance, last week, we discussed the ongoing faculty and staff engagement survey. And before that, there was a special episode in honor of Nutrition Month. You can find all shows on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast hosting platform. Episodes can also be found on the Michigan Medicine YouTube channel and as part of the headlines we can review. With that, let's bring in Kelly Miltimore Patrick, a registered nurse here at Michigan Medicine. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Now, first, mental illness seems like a very broad phrase. Can you explain sort of what it means in a clinical sense and how prevalent it is in the community? Yeah, for sure. So um, it definitely is very, very broad. Um, And I guess clinically, the way that we describe it is a condition which affects your mood, thinking, or behaviors, and that it causes some kind of difficulty with functioning. And so... um, you know, whether it's affecting you functioning at home, affecting affecting you at work, um, but it's somehow affecting you. Um, There is something called um, serious mental illness, which encompasses um, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and um, major depression. And those three are like another tier higher of um, mental illness because often they cause more decline in functioning or can interrupt a person's level of functioning if they're having um, a time that they're almost like having an ep- what we would call like an episode or destabilization. What team are you a part of at Michigan Medicine and what services does your team provide? So I'm a registered nurse. I have my bachelor's of science in nursing from Michigan State. Uh, a little controversial. And we'll forgive um, you. And <laughs> I sit for my boards for my uh, registered nurse license. Um, I work on 9C, which is our inpatient Um, adult um, unit. Um, I'm actually also trained to work on 8CAP, which is our child and adolescent unit, and also to work in um, the psychiatric emergency services as well. But my primary unit where I spend most of my time is on um, 9C, which is the adult unit. And we take care of um, people with mental illness that have gone into some kind of crisis. So if you think about the emergency room, you know, people go into the emergency room the medical emergency room when they are having a crisis, whether they're having chest pain or they're maybe they have a condition that they can tell is declining. And for mental illness, that's what we are, is we take those patients in that are declining um, or having a first onset of mental illness. And so say they're having a first onset of schizophrenia where it's the first time they've had hallucinations or delusions um, and they would usually present to an ER that way or their family practice doctor tells them, to go to the ER or even sometimes by ambulance. You know, if someone's in major, major crisis, they might come in via ambulance. Um, And then they come to us and we're a 25 bed unit. Um, I can tell you we are never empty. Um, It is a revolving door. As soon as we open a bed up, we're getting somebody else up. Um, And then when they come up to us, we do um, stabilization just like they would on any medical unit. So with a cardiac patient, you know, if you come in with a condition like coronary artery disease, um, you're not going to be cured when you leave, likely, you know, that's not possible. And it's the same thing with us. We're like, they're, we don't have them cured when they leave, but we get them stable enough that it's safe for them to go home and transition to a um, less restrictive level of care. Yeah, that makes sense. So what brought you into the nursing profession in the first place? Um, it's kind of actually an interesting story. So I'd always wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, my whole childhood and um, going off to college. It's what I wanted to do. And um, after being in college for a year, I um, had an opportunity to volunteer actually at U of M um, in pediatric cardiothoracic medicine. And um, I was kind of trying to get some experience of just being present in a medical setting for when I applied for med school. And at the end of the summer, it was just this like really profound experience where I was like, wow, I don't want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. Like I loved the hands-on with the patients. I love the education piece um, with patients and parents. Um, I guess I liked to be connecting. And, and that's not to say at all that doctors aren't connecting, but it's just a different kind of connection. And so um, 
that's kind of what transitioned me into going to nursing. So what made you um, switch to go into uh, psychiatry? So I had always been in peds medicine in some way. So I was inpatient on um, Five West, which is now 12 East at the um, the newer Mott. Um, but prior to that, I'd always worked with kids, whether it was babysitting or um, I taught gymnastics to young kids. I worked in daycare. Um, so then when I had children of my own, which is kind of its own story because my firstborn ended up having special needs, um, which I'll kind of piggyback on that. So I had Liam, who's now 19. And at the time, um, I never thought I would do anything besides pediatrics. And I was doing a lot of outpatient stuff. So whether it was, I was a school nurse for a little while, I taught childbirth education, um, just doing smaller, kind of more flexible work that I could do while staying home with him. And um, when he was not, I bet he was about a year and a half. I knew that there was something else going on. Um, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I had taken care of kids my whole life and you know, especially really young kids. We were the NIC, you, the neonatal intensive care unit grad floor um, on when I worked in Five West and I had just seen babies my whole life. And I could tell he was kind of slow to his uh, benchmarks, but I wasn't in a rush to get him tested for anything, uh, but I just knew something was up. And so you got to figure this is like 18 years ago. And so um, as time went on, um, he had a lot of speech issues. We did uh, speech therapy. He had a lot of what they call sensory issues where he was just hypersensitive to all kinds of sensory input, whether it was noises or touches, um, even like oral, if he, you know, tooth, toothbrushing was enough to make him vomit because he was just, I, I kind of say it like the volume was turned up on all of his sensory input. Um, so if there was a lawnmower down the street, he'd be plugging his ears. Um, people sing happy birthday, he'd panic because it was so loud. Um, so as time went on, we just kept trying to put together the puzzle pieces. And when he was in kindergarten, he was diagnosed, um, then it was called Asperger's syndrome, which now they call it autism spectrum disorder. Um, but he had a huge amount of anxiety. And, you know, we're trying to figure out, is this something separate? Is this something stemming from, you know, all the other input that's going on for this kiddo? Um, and by the time he was eight, he had his first episode of psychosis where he um, lost touch with reality. He was um, having hallucinations. He had auditory and visual hallucinations. Um, he would see words on the wall. And I, he, I, one time somebody must ask the question, just right. Do you have visual hallucinations? And somehow it came up about the words on the walls. And I was like, what do you mean the words on the walls? And he thought everybody saw them, that that wasn't unique to him. Um, so eventually um, he was diagnosed with early onset bipolar disorder. And I did not even know that that was a thing. Like I, of course had heard of bipolar disorder, um, but to have it, on setting so young. And it just um, catapulted us into this world that um, I wouldn't wish on anyone. It has been um, daunting at best. Um, I've met so many wonderful people in the process and we've been just so lucky with all the clinicians that have come into our lives and um, you know the support from our family and friends. Um, but, you know, let's face it, when your child's in the psych unit, you're probably not putting that on Facebook, right? And that's, and, and that was 10 years ago. So things were still pretty, um, there was more stigma then. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how I ended up getting thrown into the psychiatric world because I all of a sudden realized like this is a life for so many families. And this is so hard for us to navigate. And I'm a nurse and um, Liam's dad and I are divorced, but he's an attorney. We had good um, insurance. Um, we both weren't struggling with mental illness ourselves. My sister was a therapist and all that going for us. And it was almost unbearable to navigate. And so that's kind of what thrust me into it. Yeah. You talked a little bit about the stigma and I know that that stops a lot of people from reaching out for help, right? Why would you say it's so important to reach out, to talk to whomever you need to talk to if you or someone you love is struggling with mental illness? So one thing, really big thing I try to do with my patients um, is kind of frame mental illness as a medical model because it, it's a medical condition. So I always tell my patients, you know, our floor is no different than the cardio floor or neurology. There's something going on in your body 
And, you know, we are here to help stabilize that. So I tell them it would be like if a cardiac patient was having, you know, if their baseline was they were able to run a three mile run without any incident and all of a sudden, you know, I'm really, really short of breath and I'm having, you know, some tingling in my hand when this is happening, that's a change and that's a worry. And so I tell people with mental illness, you know, maybe you're somebody that's kind of thought, maybe I struggle a little bit with depression, but now it's getting to the point where you're having a hard time getting out of bed and you're having a hard time functioning. Um, it, those are your symptoms. It, mental illness has symptoms, cardiac has symptoms. And I feel like I try really hard to frame it that way, empower them that way, explain that to families that way that, you know, when they're getting discharged, um, what does this patient look like when their symptoms are getting worse? And, um, you know, when do you need to reach out again for care? And what does that look like? What, what are your resources to deal with the symptoms? And so I really, really think it's super important for us to get to a place where it's just commonly thought of in a medical model, because it really should be, it's no different. Um, kind of going, you know, along the lines of what you were just saying, what would you say is the biggest misconception about mental illness and, and how it's treated? So um, this is kind of an example that I is always, always stood out with me. Um, is I was at a brain conference and the um, person leading it was saying to us, if you hear the word Parkinson's syndrome, what do you think of? What do you picture in your head? And for me, what I pictured was um, an older gentleman, probably shaking somewhat, maybe a little bit confused, kind of frail, maybe using a cane. Um, and it elicited a lot of compassion and a lot of um, recognizing that this is happening to this gentleman. This guy is losing part of his functioning. And so then the next thing was that he posed is said, okay, now I want you to think, what do you think of when you hear the word schizophrenia? And I'm even a person that works in medicine, but what did that, you know, just prompt me to think of? And um, I thought back to my very first schizophrenic patient that I engaged with when I was in um, college. And he was disheveled and, um, you know, hadn't showered and was laughing at things that I didn't see. And he kept talking about a monkey washing their hair. And I realized, wow, like the, even me who works in medicine had these very different perceptions. And I think a lot of people, when they hear Parkinson's, they think um, compassion and with schizophrenia, they, they think of fear. And then what he said is schizophrenia and Parkinson's syndrome are caused by the same exact thing. They're called, caused by an imbalance in dopamine. And one thing, the Parkinson's elicits this compassion. And we don't judge that. We're not like, oh, they need to stop shaking like that. That's ridiculous. Or, you know, oh my gosh, put the cane away. You got this. Like, you know, just walk straight. You got it. Whereas with the mental illness diagnosis, we, we look at that a lot of the time as a choice behavior that we think these are choices they're making and they could choose not to. And so I think that that is the biggest reason that stigma is still so strong. And the misconception is that these are choices. When no one wants to feel this way, no one wakes up thinking, you know, I really hope that I can just stay in bed all day today and not function and not want to shower or eat or care for the people I love more than anything because they suffer from severe depression. That No one wants that to be their life. Um, so I think that, that part, if we can get to a place where we can start looking at mental illness as symptoms and realizing that they're not choices, then we will be able to move past that stigma. But I think we're so far away from it. You know, when I talk about um, psychiatry and a medical model, my patients so often look so relieved. And I feel like I've empowered them to be like, these are my symptoms. This is what comes along with my illness. And I try really hard to use that word because they're not choices. So I think that's the biggest, you know, misconception. What was the other question you asked about it? Oh, no, I was just going to ask you, um, I, I, it was about how it's treated, but um, a follow-up question to what you were saying, I was going to say, do you think that um, because of the stigma and the misconceptions, a lot of people that may have severe depression um, or bipolar, they don't want to necessarily seek help? Um, or ask someone to help them help themselves? Do you think that has a lot to do 
with how society has framed it in the past, even though it is getting better. Um, but what's your kind of take on people asking for help? I definitely think that the stigma is what prevents people from asking for help. Um, you know, you think back years and years and years ago when, because breast cancer has always been prevalent, right? It's always been around, but there was a time in life that women would not say that they had breast cancer. I mean, that was just not something that was said out loud, right? Um, and there was a stigma with that. Um, and I know also um, with colorectal cancer, you know, people don't want to talk about bowel habits or, you know, so the not so pretty disorders, you know, we're uncomfortable with. Um, and so I think psychiatry for sure, it, it's, it's not pretty. It is um, horrific and terrifying and um, overwhelming and daunting because we have so much less tangible testing for it. And so it's really hard to give concrete diagnostics for it. And so I think that that is the hugest reason. It's, it's kind of like, I compare it a lot of the time to as well to nausea in pain because those aren't quantifiable, right? So like if I'm super nauseous, I am the world's biggest baby. I hate being nauseous. If I vomit, it's the end of the world, right? So with my best friend, she had morning sickness all day long and she could be on the way to work, throw up on the side of the road, get back in the car and go. So she tolerates nausea better than me. Um, does that mean that my nausea doesn't matter. No, it's just how it's affecting my body. Maybe really what it is, is that my nausea is so much more powerful and I feel so sick that it's debilitating. So I tell people with, with depression, it's the same type of thing. When people say like, you know, you just need to get up and jump in the shower and, you know, let's go for a walk or let's go to a movie. And I say, well, imagine if you were in bed and you were so nauseous, you could barely move and that moving was painful that you could not tolerate it. And someone just kept saying to you, well, just, you know, jump in the shower. What, you know, we wouldn't say that to a nauseous person. We'd be bringing them a bucket. We'd be asking them, do you need a cold compress? You would be saying, you know, will saltines help? Can we maybe get you some Sprite? What can we do to help you feel like you're ready to get out of bed? And so with depression, you know, we don't frame it that way. And so people are embarrassed about it. They're not, you know, because there's no quantifiable information to prove. Look at, I really feel this coming. This is really how bad it is. And it's just heartbreaking. So those are things that we can sort of work on from a personal perspective, right? We can do a better job of, of having empathy for people and, and working with them to help them. What do you think our society as a whole can do to sort of improve, you know, care for those who have mental illness or improve um, psychiatry and mental illness as a bigger priority in our society? So um, I have a pretty strong opinion about this. Um, in, you know, this is just based on my experience. And so there's um, an organization called the One Mind Foundation. And the One Mind Foundation is, um, a lot of it is geared towards research. But the fascinating thing about the One Mind Foundation, and the reason I bring it up is because they, their quest is to get brain health all into one category. So what we tend to do is we have neurology, and then we have psychiatry, and then you have traumatic brain injury, which is part of neurology, but it's still kind of its own thing, right? But they're all the brain, and there's so much overlap. Um, and so I think until we, psychiatry is the um, ugly redheaded stepchild. You know, we, we really are. Um, and I think until we just look at it as brain illness, um, I think it's going to take that. I think it's going to move it. It's going to take to move it to the same um, level of priority. And I don't know that keeping it separate from brain health and brain illness and brain research will ever give it the same um, level of importance. You know, I think that um, it's kind of like the stigma is what it is with psychiatry. So I almost feel like, well, what if we just look at brain illnesses as a whole and how we treat the brain? Because it's your brain. So I had a patient one time that um, was hallucinating. And it's the only patient I've ever had that had um, what they call olfactory hallucinations. And he was hallucinating that he smelled bleach. And he, at one point we were talking and all of a sudden he's like, wait, Kelly, do you smell that? I smell it right now. I'm smelling, I smell bleach. You don't smell it? And I said, no, I don't smell it, but I absolutely believe you smell it. There's probably something going on in the olfactory center of your brain right now that is triggering this smell to you. And that is real for you. So what, what is going on there, right? Uh, if you're seeing things on the walls, 
this is a symptom and we need to get to a place where we figure out what's going on in the brain that is causing, for lack of a better word, this misfiring or this misinformation that is affecting this person to have hallucinations. And so I think that that is going to come when we unite all of brain health and illness together. Do you think that um, like marketing and education also can play a factor in that as far as just ed educating the general public by like raising awareness of our brain health? Oh, I absolutely do. I think the more that it's talked about, you know, the, the more comfortable it becomes. So um, my sister and I both have, so Liam is autistic, has autism, has bipolar disorder, and he also has epilepsy. And my sister's eight-year-old son has autism. And we kind of, and we use humor to get through really tough stuff, right? That's how her and I cope. But we say that autism is the new black, like, you know, it's the new color of the season or the new um, comfortable thing that you're seeing everywhere, right? You see it in Hollywood, you see it in television shows. Um, and that's awesome. Like, I think it's so fantastic. So I feel like autism is super easy to talk about. And that was because they did so much awareness in our society. And we had the lighted up blue campaigns and you had the Eiffel Tower blue, you had, you know, the White House lighting it up blue. Um, I still think there's lack of knowledge about really the ins and outs of autism. I think it's in some ways, and, and autism is actually um, in the DSM-5, which is the psychiatric manual, which is really interesting, right? Because I feel like it's its own little entity and people probably are surprised to hear that it's a psychiatric um, diagnosis. So I, I definitely think that marketing piece is what got us comfortable with autism. And I feel like that marketing piece could change things for psychiatry as well. Um, but I also think a huge thing, and this is kind of like my dream of what we could do with our youth is we need to integrate it into the beginning of their lives. It needs to be something that we're talking about in health class. It needs to be something that we're talking about, you know, just like we talk about history or math. Like it's fantastic that my kids know how to do, you know, triple digit division or that they are familiar with World War II. But if they don't know how to function when there's a crisis that happens, um, I kind of, I, say like, we're all going to have to learn how to cope in our lives, right? We're all going to have to figure out ways to deal with things. And if you have a crisis going on, if you don't have tools, you're going to grab weapons. And so if we can give kids tools from a very young age and anticipate that there's going to be things that are going to happen to them, they're going to create adaptive coping strategies as opposed to maladaptive coping. And so I feel like it starts at a very young age at empowering them um, you know, we do jump rope for heart and we bring all this attention to cardiac health and diet and the food pyramid. And that's wonderful, but we're not talking about the most crucial organ in our body that literally dictates down to our heart beating. Why is that not at the forefront of conversations in the forefront of um, education? I just feel like it, that would be a game changer. Can you suggest um, any books or podcasts that are related to mental illness or mental health that you um, that you'd like to share with our audience? So, you know, I read a ton, um, but I don't necessarily read one specific author or book. So, I guess what I would say is that I use NAMI a lot, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and they are a resource for so many different things. They're a resource for clinicians. They um, have outreach in almost every state. They have um, national groups and then they have state groups and then they have local groups. So like I know Washtenaw County has a NAMI organization, um, but there's a tons of information on there and there's um, webcasts that you can watch or you can also use them, you know, use it as a podcast and listen to it. Um, another, this is kind of not necessarily on a professional level, but I still think it's really, really good information is um, a website called The Mighty. And The Mighty was started by a family that they had a child with um, special needs. And they recognized how absolutely overwhelming it was and that how could they help other families go through this. And so The Mighty started out as this really small thing, but now it has tons of information about all kinds of different special needs and their um, mental health and mental illness, which are different, right? Mental health is what do I need to do to stay 
healthy, just like heart health. And then mental illness is what do I do now that I'm sick or how do I learn more about my disorder? Um, so I love that. And they've got tons of different, you can listen to audio stuff on there. You can watch videos, you can read things. They have um, the mighty, you can follow them on almost everything. And I love it. I think it's just a great resource for people. It also does a lot with not making, you don't feel alone. You read all these articles of what other people are going through and they're, you know, day-to-day -day people just like us that are sharing their truth. And so I really love both of those. Um, I love how you said that, you know, mental health is more so like, you know, kind of like your, your health habits, right? Like how can I, you know, drink my water and do this and, you know, self-help myself. Um, but then like the mental illness portion is more so like, you know, now that I know, how can I move forward? And I think sometimes um, a lot of things that we see online or on TV that are shared, it blends the two to where they're not different. And I think, you know, sadness is different than major, like a major depressive episode. But I think sometimes those are just intertwined and people don't understand the difference. So I love, I love how you put that. And I do hope that that messaging kind of gets shared a little bit more. Yeah, thanks. I do feel like it's, another one of those things that are gonna be a game changer, right? Because when someone is genuinely really suffering from a disorder, they're not in a state of wellness. It's, it's not where they're at, you know? Um, and so I think that, like you said, we have to be able to recognize that depression is not, you know, I didn't, depression can be triggered by things, certainly by uh, things that affect us, but just because you're having a bad day or two, does that mean you're depressed? You know, depression looks very different than that. And I think we say that too with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, there's this like language, right? Like, oh, you're so OCD. And, and I don't think people are doing it to be cruel. I really, I don't, but true obsessive compulsive disorder is debilitating, which we talked about at the beginning. What is mental illness, right? It changes your level of functioning. And so obsessive compulsive disorder it, these people can be stuck in that loop where they can't get out of their house because if they don't do everything in the exact order or, or something interrupts it, now they're starting over. So how do you get to work when you can't even get to your garage? Um, you know, you hear that people joke about, um, oh my gosh, they're so manic. Look at them. They're so manic. Or, oh my gosh, they're so bipolar. And, um, you know, my son is really insightful. And he one time asked me, mom, what do people mean when they say, you're so bipolar. Like, are they trying to be mean? And um, I said, you know, buddy, I don't think they're trying to be mean. I think they're almost using it like a slang word. But what we don't realize is usually words like that, eventually it comes out that they've been hurtful. So, you know, the, the R word, I don't even like to say it, right? People used to say it all the time. And I don't think that those people were necessarily being hateful. I just think it became this slang but when you have a child or a loved one who, you know, has a cognitive impairment, like those aren't slang, that's not funny language. And, um, you know, I think we got to balance it between being hyper, hypersensitive, because I think that's kind of a turnoff to people. Um, but I explained to him, like, you know, buddy, when people say you're so dumb, you know, at the beginning, they were making fun of people that were deaf and mute that couldn't communicate. And that's what they were saying. Like you couldn't come up with a response. So you must be dumb. And here we are all these years later, still using that language. And I'm not saying, I think we need to remove all potentially possible offensive language. Cause I think we couldn't talk, but I think it's just being insightful to what we say and what does it mean? And what is it diminishing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've dealt with that my whole life because I have a physical disability and I use a wheelchair and, and just comments like, you know, oh, you can't walk, you ride the short bus. Things like yeah. that, you know, which it's like, I did ride the short bus to school because it had a wheelchair lift. Like that's how I got to school. And, right. you know, it is, it's the, it's the language and the slang that can be very hurtful to people. Yeah. And I think that, you know, then that shuns people more from getting help, right. Yep. You know, or, or being able to put yourself out there um, and feel safe that you're not going to be ridiculed if in some way your disability is, sh shows through, right. Like we shouldn't have to hide things that is a disability. I mean, yep. it should never have to be something that's hidden. Yeah, yeah. I remember having, I, I had a few depressive years um, and I just remember the things that people would say and it was, I, I just couldn't understand. It was like, you know, you need to get out of bed or you need to just pray about it or, you know, like get yourself together. And it's like, like, what do you mean? Like I've I literally cannot do anything, you know? Right. Um, and I you just, you remember, you know, what people or, or you, I remember what people said to me during those, those times. And I just try to make sure that, 
if I see someone is not their regular selves, you know, you ask the right questions or you don't say anything, right? You, you, you're very supportive of that person. And so I, I do try to share that message with my friends and family, um, you know, whenever something isn't right, or if there is right. something that's going on in their lives of just being respectful and knowing that. And a lot of my friends that I've had, you know, extreme sadness or actual depression have come to me oh, um, sure. and asked, you know, and asked me questions about it. And that way we can actually have a dialogue that helps the other person too. Yeah. And I think that once we admit something, it's like people come out of the woodwork, right? Like, oh, well, I, this, or, you know, all of a sudden there's this comfort level. And I think there's such a relief about that. Um, so I kind of have a funny story about kind of my way when everything kind of came out to the forefront that Liam struggled with mental illness and um, was really struggling with his bipolar disorder. Um, at that point, he was eight and everybody knew that he was autistic. And like I said, that was a comfortable thing to say and not, you know, not anything that um, made people, I don't think, uncomfortable. And then he started um, having symptoms with his bipolar disorder and they were super concerning. I mean, very, very concerning symptoms. Um, and I, you can tell just by, I'm very much a chatterbug and I'm not shy and I talk about things, but I didn't talk about it. And with really any, anyone besides in our real close circle. Well, then he had gotten really, really sick and, um, he was 10 and he needed to be hospitalized psychiatrically. And there were no beds in the entire state of Michigan. Um, we had waited in the waiting room off and on for four days, um, at U of M. And at the time I wasn't on staff there, but I don't know that it would have mattered if there's not a bed, there's not a bed, you know, I mean, there, there just isn't space. Um, and what we were frantic and he was suicidal and he was, um, self-harming where he would punch his head or scratch himself. And we were having to literally monitor him 24 seven. And my sister with all the best intentions in the world panicked and was desperate for help as we all were. Um, and we've been calling all over the place. I mean, we had called Ohio and places out on the East coast that I knew had really strong programs. And, um, one morning I woke up and I literally had like a hundred messages in my inbox on messenger. And she had put out there that, um, you know, like basically mayday, does anyone have any connections in psychiatry? My, um, sister's son, my nephew is really, really sick. And they've been in the ER for all these days. And, um, you know, this is what's going on. And at first I was like, dude, what, <laughs> what did you just do? I feel like I'm driving down the road, you know, my underwear hanging from the antenna, like my whole, mm -hmm. but you know what? It was unbelievable what that propelled and like the comfort level of people telling me things or people, um, reaching out. And my friends ended up making a meal train for us. Like they would, if you were getting chemo, you know, they were making meals and dropping them off and people, um, sharing with me, oh, well, this happened with my nephew or my cousin. Um, so it actually prompted me to write a book about it because everyone are, when you have someone with mental illness, I say like, you can't make this stuff up that is going on. You just can't. And, um, I was struggling so much to stay above water and people kept saying, you should write a book about this because I am a clinician. I am a mom and um, I actually have a, a second degree in elementary education. So I've been in the educational portion of things. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to write about it and I'm going to be raw and I'm going to be honest and I'm going to tell the ugly things about it and the beautiful things about it. Um, and I thought, you know, if this can help any other family feel less alone um, because I'm saying it out loud, like I'm going to do it. And I'm so glad I did it. I'm so glad that I put it out there. I'm so glad that if he, we live in a small town and if, you know, we're almost anywhere, we'll run into someone. And if he's struggling, like people are so kind and they want to help. Or when Mira was little, cause he, I also have a daughter, um, who, um, is she's now 15 and Liam's 19. And, um, you know, can we grab Mira? Can, you know, why don't we take her? We'll go to the park. I mean, but it, getting it out there. Wow. It was, it was a hard step and I'm glad she pulled the bandaid off. You know, I'm really grateful that she did. I think that that story just highlights and it sort of it full it comes full circle with our conversation where one of the first questions we asked was how prevalent is this in our community and i think that it shows that it's incredibly prevalent almost everyone either themselves or knows somebody who's going through this right and it is actually easy to empathize because you've experienced it yourself yeah i, I definitely think so i actually 
um, when we, I knew we were going to be doing this, I kind of was like curious because I'm kind of a statistics nerd and I'm, I love reading. And um, so I thought, gosh, I wonder what the numbers are at now, because we just know it's with the pandemic in particular and the isolation that's gone on with that. And then, you know, with a lot of places closed down and not getting the supports they needed. Um, so as of 2020, um, one out of 20 people experiences serious mental illness. So when you think about that, that schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or a major depressive disorder. So one out of 20 is have really, really significant mental illness. So when you look at that with cardio, what would that be? That would be, they had to have open heart surgery, or maybe they had a major heart attack, right? But one out of five, one out of five adults have experienced mental illness in their lifetime. And um, one out of 15 have substance use in conjunction with mental illness. Um, and then when you look at it from the kid's perspective, this just is crazy to me that 20% of adolescents have experienced some kind of mental health disorder. And it is the second leading cause, suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 14 and 25 to 34, the second leading cause of death. And the reason I skipped 15 to 24, because their suicide is the third leading cause of death. So if we just say across the board, it, suicide is the third leading cause of death for ages 10 to 34, how is this not in, in the forefront of everything? The second leading cause of death of our children? I mean, how are we not talking about this? How is this not a major crisis, right? Like it is a crisis, but it's not being addressed. And I think everything we've touched on, you know, it's the stigma of it. It's people afraid to reach out. It's, you know, lack of resources, not because people don't care, but I mean, University of Michigan is huge. We have 25 beds. That psychiatric ER is packed. So we have so many things working against us in we're the United States and we live in Washtenaw County. So like imagine living in the UP or, you know, living in an area. I, last I knew, Washtenaw County was the only county in the state that when they looked at necessary child and adolescent psychiatrists for per population, Washington County was the only county in the state that had enough psychiatrists, but then they're being, you know, they're being taxed because they're helping people from Oakland and Livingston. People are probably driving from Grand Rapids for supports here. So it's just, the prevalence is absolutely astounding. I was having a conversation with a couple of mental health professionals um, and they were saying how overwhelmed therapists and psychiatrists are at this time, especially because of COVID, um, where there's wait lists for patients and they're trying to get everyone in. And, and, you know, this is just a really difficult time for them as well, because they're trying to help all these people that have, that were in isolation for, for two years, um, but also suffered, you know, losses and they're grieving and they, you know, financial crisis. And they're just all these things that snowballed. And there's just, you know, as much as we push their and say, you know, go to therapy. And these, you know, these mental health professionals too are also extremely overwhelmed as they're trying to help our communities. Yeah. I mean, I think that we're all exhausted, right? We're all exhausted after these last two years. And um, people kept saying that mental illness was going to be the second phase of COVID and, and it's here. I mean, yeah. we are seeing such sick patients and it's heartbreaking. It is absolutely heartbreaking. And the thing is, we need the resources and, and I don't know how, um, how we get that change. So Patrick Kennedy from the family of the Kennedys um, is really involved in mental health and mental illness. And, um, you know, he's on a legislative level, tried to make changes and is so committed to mental health parity laws, which mean that mental, that um, insurance companies cannot treat mental illness patients with a different level of coverage than with um, medical illness, but even that like sentence I just said, right? Mental illness with medical illness. Why, why am I as a professional even separating those? But they are, right? But I think to myself, if Patrick Kennedy cannot make this change happen, because he's been fighting for this mental health parity for years and years, and the law passed, but now it's enforcing it. And now it's families having to then sue the insurance companies to get the coverage. But these families are in over their heads when they wake up, right? Like they're managing either themselves with a mental illness or their loved one with a mental illness. And they're, you know, like you said, there's grief going on and there's, you know, are, are you employed? How are you paying for things? You do not have the time, energy or resources to be suing an insurance company. So I just think like, if he can't make change and I shouldn't say can't, but like, I mean, it is like moving a mountain 
And I, I don't know how it happens. Like I, I get so frustrated and angry that the third leading cause of death of our children is being uncomfortably pushed to the side. And I just, I, just, I, I, I can't accept it and I don't know how to change it. Well, I think one way to change it is through conversations like this. So thank you so much, Kelly, for sharing this candid, your candid viewpoint on this topic. Um, I think, you know, if, if our listeners and our viewers can take this conversation, you know, back to their family, back to their friends, back to their colleagues, I think we can just start to make, you know, change on a very small level. So thanks again. Keep for... writing books, Kelly. <laughs> Keep writing thank books. you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Kelly. Well, your work here is not done. Uh, we have what we call the lightning round when we ask our guests four quick fire questions that they haven't seen before. So are you ready to go? I'm ready. Okay. So we asked about a book or podcast related to mental, mental health earlier. So if you had to choose, would you rather read or would you rather listen to a podcast or watch a movie? Gosh, I would watch a movie, but it would be a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still learning during it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, spring officially arrives this week. What are you most looking forward to in the warmer weather? Oh, all the spring smells, like everything's starting, the buds, the chirping, the worms on the sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> What's one piece of advice you would have for someone that's interested in going into nursing? Oh, gosh. Um, keep in mind that there's so many areas you can go into. And so if you, if you land in a place that you don't love, keep looking because you have to love what you're doing. So just look for a specialty that is a match for you. Excellent. Now, if you had to pick one job that wasn't nursing, what would it be and why? Um, I would be a writer because that's, I love writing and that's, I'm super passionate about it. And so I would be a writer. I guess Kelly, I am a writer because I wrote a book. I, I would say you would are a writer. You are a nurse and a writer. So pick something else. <laughs> <laughs> you say I would be a full-time New York Times bestselling. <laughs> yeah. And that's, there I, you I go. seriously, I've always joked, like, I need to get on Ellen because I want, I want it, my book to go viral. So people will learn about what mental illness looks like from, from the inside out. Cause it's, it's called a zebra in a field of horses because when I met another mom, whose child struggled with um, special needs. She said she felt like she finally met a fellow zebra in a field of horses, but it's a zebra in a field of horses. One parent's candid truth about raising a child with special needs. And I, I want, I like want to scream it from the rooftops, you know, for what it's like. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Kelly, um, for providing your perspective on mental illness. Um, if you're interested in learning more on mental illness and wellness, be sure to stay tuned to Michigan Medicine Headlines in the weeks and months ahead. You'll find these type of stories at mmheadlines.org. That's mmheadlines.org. All right. Now, this is a special two episode week of the wrap. So we won't have a trivia contest today, but stay tuned later in the week for another show and another chance to win a prize. With that, thank you again, Kelly, for joining us. And thanks, as always, to all of our listeners and viewers for everything you do for patients, families, and each other. We'll see you next time.